And just real quick, the thing I found funny was the, I think the statement was released by Andrew Wilson, which is EA CEO. And he's like, yeah, we need to do this in order to stay firm and fit and move towards creating very immersive experiences for the player. And I'm like, look, with the what? next immersive player, the the next immersive experience you make for a player will be the first immersive experience you guys have ever made for a player. <laughs> are you are you forgetting your electronic arts? Are you forgetting your EA? Hello and welcome to level ninety nine of the Thoughts and Players podcast, the gaming podcast of all takes and no strings attached. I am Jeremy here with my compadre David. What up? What up? How are you doing this evening? How's everything going? Uh, everything's going fine. I uh, just had a nice dinner. Um, it was really good. It was uh, a salad. Very simple. Just the lettuce, uh, mm-hmm. some bacon, and then my partner. She makes this awesome like dill sauce mm. and uh, some guacamole. Okay. That was it. And it was amazing. Yeah. Simple, so but, it, but, simple. but elegant. Sounds yeah. quite elegant. Yeah. How, yeah. how about you? How, how's your day? Um, It's going all right. Haven't really had dinner. Haven't been too hungry. Had lunch earlier. Nothing elegant. Just a shawarma wrap. A chicken I mean, shawarma wrap and a nice lemon really rice soup. Big soup person over here. Love soups. Eat I'm very anti-soup. That's funny. I know. I think we have, I think this is one of the discussions we had at the bar. I think so. About just how you're missing out on the soups. Anytime. Yeah, any, any, anytime says. of the year. Soup. You got to get a good one. Like, ah, uh, I've tried. Or you make them from, I mean, the best, obviously the best soups are homemade soups. Make some homemade potato soup. Get some Yukon gold potatoes. Saute them up first. You got to saute them to get the flavor in them. Some garlic, some onion, maybe some leeks. I love leeks in soup. Yeah, leeks right? are good. Get it going, a little bit of butter, a little bit of heavy cream. You whip it in, get some nice chicken stock in there. You know what I'm saying? If you, if you want to buy the, the store stuff, you can. But I say make it at home, homemade chicken stock. Add whatever you want to it, some carrots, uh, some celery. I mean, it's great. It's fantastic. Um, maybe, I don't know, if people want it, we'll do a bonus level soup recipe. Because <laughs> I got I, I got a bunch. I got a, a surprisingly a lot of thoughts on soup. Yeah, you just had that ready like just on deck. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a go-to. It's a go-to. Um, one time I made a chipotle okra soup. Oh man, that just sounds um, good. Ch- with with chorizo in it. Oh, fantastic! Anyway, welcome to level <laughs> ninety nine, ladies and gentlemen. Chicken sucks and hens. We welcome you to this level of the pod. Um, I say, you know, it's 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 been an interesting time in gaming. We have some game, a couple of game topics. Obviously, we're going to jump into. Uh, but before we jump into those, as we like to do first. We're going to talk about the games we've been playing. Now, if I recall last time, um, David, we both were basically too busy to play games, really. Mm-hmm. So we talked about the little moments we were been able to sneak in. I'm wondering, have you had any more time to play games compared to last time? Or has it been the same with your time commitments? I did. Uh, I've been playing a lot of Apex uh, with the new season going on and everything, I went from bronze to gold one already. Okay. We'll see how uh, how long it takes me to get from gold to diamond, because plat is the hard part for me. And yeah. then I haven't been playing Overwatch because I got banned. Yeah. I'm not too sure why. Like, I'm I know sure why, why, because I got into, like, an argument with a team or whatever, you know, blaming each other, this, that, and the other. It looks like uh, we all just reported each other, and mm. who knows if any of them were affected, but I was. The old so, Spider-Man meme, huh? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. until I think it was, what, March 7th or something, I'm not playing that. Uh. But I've been playing a lot of TFT, too. I've been kind of getting a better handle on things there. Hmm. Uh, we'll talk more of that. Uh, what have you been playing? I have had a little bit more time to play than before when I had absolutely no time. Um, so I've been playing two games. Have I been playing two games? Yes, two games. Before I played two games, one of those games was Madden. Madden is not that on that list anymore. 
thank the Lord. Phew. Uh, one, they've been, but they're both older games. So the first game that I probably played the least of, but got into, is uh, Kingdoms of Amalur Re-Reckoning. Now, I don't know if you recall me mentioning this game, because it Sounds was... Sounds vaguely familiar. So the, the game was Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning was the original. It came out a long time ago. And then a couple of years ago, they did a remaster, Re-Reckoning, that they released on the Xbox One and on the PlayStation 4. And I was super hyped to play it again. And then I had never I never opened it. <laughs> Finally opened it. Finally opened it and uh, jumped into it, played, you know, like the opening kind of dungeon area and a couple of extra things. And I'm thoroughly enjoyed it. it I, I, it's bringing back the memories of why I like the game so much. So I'm hoping to actually see that through the completion, which I believe I will. The other game that I've been playing, putting more time into, and it's very, it's very interesting. It's weird. Not a good game. Okay, I admit that up front, as I do always. Not a good game. But the game is a licensed game. And that game is Scarface, The World Is Yours. Now, what? for just a little backstory, just a little context, right? So this happened because the other day I was watching a movie with my mom and she brought up Scarface. Now, Scarface is one of my favorite movies, but I haven't watched it in years because when I was in my late teens, I watched it every week. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I've watched Scarface 30 times. That's enough. That's more than enough times of watching this movie in my lifetime. I'm done. Well, she had it on. I just watched it again. And I was just reminded of, man, I love this movie. And then I remember they made a game for it, right? Um, the Vendy Games developed it. It was published by Sierra and um, Sierra Games. And for those that don't maybe or may not know Sierra, Sierra's mostly known for their strategy city, city builder games. So something like Caesar Three, Pharaoh, um, I think I can't remember if it was the Last Kingdom or something like that. But mostly they're city builder games. They're known for those classic, legendary city builder games. But they were also publishing. They started to publish a little bit more games. One game they decided to publish was Scarface. It was, by all accounts, a horrible business decision. <laughs> but they decided. To Seems do. like way out of the realm. Like no, yes, yes, nothing in comparison. Um. Uh, the the game had um and this is actually reminding me of a topic i had in mind my topics change for this episode but i'll use it for the next episode maybe uh but the game has a bunch of actors in it from that time that are either that are either most of them are more famous now than they were then and they were used as like credits or whatever um but the game is basically a gta clone you're tony you're tony montana in this scenario you survived the murder the assassination attempt sent by Sosa and you're trying to rise again. You lost all your money, all your stuff. You're trying to get all your money back, all your weapons back, all your Coke back. You're trying to get all of it back. <laughs> that's, that, that's the journey of this game. And so you're having to launder money. You're having to buy fronts. Um, and this all takes place in Miami. So yeah, this for me, is it, does it feel, is it scratching a little bit of a GTA Vice City scratch for me? Yeah. It's for me. Yeah. A little bit. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been playing. Um, and, uh, I've been having fun with it. Look, it's supposed to be a 16 yeah, to 17 hour game. It's not complex. This has replaced Madden as far as the dumb thing I need to play to <laughs> soothe my mind. And I'm happy because at least they tried with this game. They tried at least with this one. They don't try at all with Madden. Um, so yeah, those are the two games I've been playing though. And I've been playing the Scarface because it's an older game, I've been playing the PS2 version on the PS2 emulator on my on my PC. So it's been running at a very brisk 30 frames per second for that game, Wonderful. right? Because uh, they capped it a lot back then. So, um, yeah, it's been fun. It's been fun. Before we go to topics, I do want to bring up how you didn't play that game or open it until, like, the, just recently. And yeah. I, I remember I kind of did that with mirror's edge i think it's catalyst or something yeah. it was the second one mm -hmm. i bought it and i actually never opened it yeah i still have a sealed copy yeah yeah for sure uh. i've still got unopened games um uh my partner always brings up the one time like when i got like when i was able to get the ps5 when no one else could get it and i didn't open it for like four months i just because I, I just didn't get to it 
this was this is when right. we had the gaming podcast. That. It would seem like I would have an incentive to open it up and get to it. I just didn't feel compelled to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, I, I do that a lot. I do that a lot. But the thing is though, like you're buying it, for, you're buying it for the journey. You're buying it for the experience. You don't care about getting in with everyone else. There's no FOMO happening. You're like, you know what? I'm interested in this game on my own. I'm gonna play it in its own time, and it's gonna be glorious. So yeah, I'm playing a remastered game three years after it was remastered. And that's just what it is, you know? It's all good. Yeah. Uh, but we got, you like you were saying, we've got topics. So I'm curious, do you want to go with mine first? Is it a little heavier? Or would you want to go with yours first? Kind of get, it, it, I, don't, I don't know. I feel like maybe we want to end on a lighter note. That's what I was thinking. So you know, let's I'll, bring, it, bring it down, turn down the lights, and then we'll bring them back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if my topic will bring it down the lights. I might just bring everyone down. But uh, I've been thinking about this. Uh, speaking of bringing it down, dim, dark. I have been recently, and by recently I mean a little bit of today, pondering: Are we on the precipice of the beginning of the dark age of gaming? Not the collapse, not a crash. Because I think those are ridiculous. The industry is too big for that. Um, but are we in the midst of a dark age? And the reason I'm I'm thinking about that is because there's recently been a lot of news in gaming with layoffs. Okay, EA just announced they're laying off 600 people globally. PlayStation has announced they're laying off 900 people. This is after M- Microsoft already had their mass layoffs of I forgot however many hundreds of people. Right. We're talking about over the course of maybe six to eight months, thousands, possibly tens of thousands of layoffs happening in gaming and gen- widely more widely in tech, but just speaking specifically to gaming. Right. This is also on the precipice of some of the biggest game releases ever. Right. We've talked about last year being one of the biggest years of gaming. Right. Almost every big game was having some audience. It was selling some millions of copies. Yeah. Right. My Xbox, Microsoft just spent some odd billion dollars acquiring Activision and then had to lay off like a thousand people, right? So you couple that in with also like these games, we're seeing a lot of boom and then dragging down with games. So for example, like, you know, right now, what's the big game? Hell Divers 2. That's what everyone's talking about. That's what I was going to say. Before Hell Divers 2, it was Enshrouded. Everyone was playing Enshrouded. And then uh, before Enshrouded, everyone was playing Power World. Yep. And then before Power World, everyone was playing like the finals or something like that, right? So looking at like the finals, for instance, the finals went from having a peak concurrent player base of like 300,000 people to 50,000 people. Power World went from having Dang. a peak concurrent player base of 2.1 million players to about half a million players. These are still huge numbers. Wow. But are these games setting up their roadmaps and their future forward based on these higher numbers that they eventually get? And then everyone's over the hype and they go back to playing the same games they've been playing, right? Because everyone just wants to fit in. Everyone complains about innovation and creativity, but doesn't want any of it, right? Right. So um, those aren't sustainable. How, How sustainable are they? You understand what I'm saying? We think about, and I've talked about games like Valheim, which was super huge, Zeitgeist, whatever. Mm. What is their player base now? And is it able to sustain a studio like that? Right. You think about No Man's Sky, like how big that was, and like what the, what are the numbers now that help sustain that studio? It, it seems like they've been doing it, but but what does it look like? How how lean do these companies have to run now? When you when you you know bucket that in with like, you know, the kind of, you know, tumultuous existence of double-A games and the very tumultuous existence of triple-A games where you have something as big as Skull and Bones crashing and burning. Skull and Bones did such a terrible release that players for Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, which Skull and Bones is basically based off of its mechanics, sees a 200% rise in players because Skull and Bones is so just not it. <laughs> People are like, let me go play the old thing that it was based on because that's better. Right. So um, that's, you know, because you have that failing. You have um, Suicide Squad kill the Justice League failing. You know, this is on top of all these other big IPs that come in and crash and burn. Right. Right. 
it seems unsustainable. You have, um, you know, uh, council makers getting ready to, you know, push us into a next gen of councils because, you know, we're, we're trying to, to figure out how we're going to make this more sustainable and make it more uh, uh, financially viable. We're trying to push digital more because we are trying to find any sliver we can to, to, to find more money, but also our games cost more and they take longer. So there's a whole a whole storm of things happening, just in just industry related, right? And then we pack onto it the economy and financial of things for just ordinary regular people, the consumers that it would be. I'm wondering if we're heading in a place where it is literally all about survival, and that uh, real creativity and innovation is going to have to take a backseat. Because these places are just trying to stay in business. They're just trying to keep the lights on. And that's what it's going to be for the next two to three years. It seems ridiculous to say. You think about some of the ideas and, and games that are on the horizon. And you, you say how. And then you look at last year and you say last year is one of the biggest years ever. How can we be headed towards a dark age? Um, sometimes it happens like that. There's the last gusto and then all of a sudden there's a cliff. And you just hit that cliff and it's just, it's <laughs> smooth sailing down. You know, it becomes your acme in Looney Tunes. It just, you just fall straight down. You see it fall down in the eyes and like, what? And then it just drops down. It could be <laughs> what? That. So I'm, I'm, I'm just pondering with all of these things, like what is gaming going to look like for the next two or three years? Because it looks like a lot of these places now, a lot of areas in games, it's just how do we survive? How do we make right. it? I don't, I, I, we don't have the room to innovate, right? Um, and obviously you'll see some games innovate and they may be the ones to actually break through and really have a hold on things. But I think that's not going to be the norm. I think the norm is going to be, how do we survive? How do we hold on? You know? Um, and it's like, that's, if that's, if that's where gaming is at right now, gaming has reached its dark age faster than the, than, than film had. Film at least had a golden age, you could argue, for maybe 20, 30, 40 years. Right. Gaming has had a golden age for, what, 20? So, uh, you know, and it, and it seems like it's getting to that point where where cinema, where movies are now, kind of like dying on the vine a little bit, except for the occasional boom that happens. And those booms aren't sustainable either. So, you know, I don't know. Yeah. So, like, it's tough because... Like you said, the economy and stuff is like all all about profit and stuff, and you get more profit when you have less people. So they're just yes. having all these people work on these like amazing games that are coming out, and they're like, okay, cool, we made our release profit piece. You're out. Yeah, you know, but who's who's gonna be there working on everything? The the ten people you're gonna overwork for eighty hours a week. That you don't want that, to unionize? Th that they're going to burn out. They're, they're going to, you know, even if they're at work, they're going to be overtired and everything. Yeah. And what what's going to come next? What You have this awesome game release. What about the next people? You're going to hire a bunch of new people to yeah. make awesome games? Like, I, under, I understand the new people are going to know the new things and stuff like that. But, like, you need somebody with the experience to mm -hmm. kind of push push the direction of everything. Yeah. You you're not going to have that if you don't have anybody that's been there. Right. Yeah, and just and yeah, yeah, 100%. And um it's I mean a lot said, a lot a lot comes out with these places when they do layoffs, when they get rid of people, a lot of times the first ones to go are contractors, right? subcontractors are the first one to get the boot but it's like you know again it's reaching everyone you have you know with that with ea and and sony and i'm for sure with the, i'm not sure i can't, I can't remember what's with some of the other layoffs but with those two specifically i remember them saying hey like we're gonna have to cancel games because of this like uh ea yep, I, yep. ea had their layoff and they're like we're gonna have to cancel the star wars fps game that we had respawn developing and i'm like oh okay great so um, Respawn is just going to make Apex and only Apex for now on forever. And, and Jedi Fallen See? blank, whatever it is. Like, we're not going to get any other thing like that. And just real quick, the thing I found funny was the, I think the statement was released by Andrew Wilson, 
which is EA CEO. And he's like, yeah, we need to do this in order to stay firm and fit and, and you know, and, and, and move towards creating very immersive, you know, um, experiences for the player. And I'm like, look, with the what? next immersive player, the, the next immersive experience you make for a player will be the first immersive experience you guys have ever made for a player. <laughs> are you are you forgetting your electronic arts? Are you forgetting your EA? Are you serious? Hey, by the way, Andrew Wilson, I hiked the football in Madden and my linemen don't move. That's the only job they're supposed to do in real life. They don't have to do it in your game, but immersive gaming experiences. Yeah, sure. That's in your bag. Oh, it feels so real. Right? But he- even as someone who plays Apex almost all the time, that I why focus on one game? That's crazy. Even if it is one of your most profitable things, there's so many consumer complaints that they just don't do anything about. Yeah. If they don't fix those, besides just making new skins that cost twenty dollars or whatever, oh here's another event you can spend two hundred dollars on for this heirloom mm-hmm. for a character that some people don't even play it's gonna die yeah well it's also the thing part of my my and then they're screwed all the eggs in one basket right part of my frustrations with it though is that respawn is good they are why put why put good on just one like i understand having the the madden team maybe sit to to madden because they they don't make that good lord knows they can't make nothing else good right so just leave them there but Respawn makes good. They've they've shown they have two IPs or two projects you've put them in control of with Jedi Fallen Order and Jedi Survivor. Mm-hmm. And then and in Apex, right? And they their other previous ones with Titanfall, Titanfall 2, and they're all good. They do good stuff. Yeah. So that has to suffer because of the economics of everything, you know? Um, and you know, PlayStation is the same. They had to lay off 900 people. Um, I think they said there were some games that possibly need to be canceled or put on hold i look at him and say hey playstation you buy a bungee smart move it looks like in hindsight right the guy was freaking <laughs> he was complaining i think the ceo was complaining like four months ago like bungee's got to find some way to be profitable it's like okay great way to say it now buddy after you pay two bill for him you know it's it's insane and i think that um all of these different things are going to eventually end up with us being in kind of a little bit of a dark age. We kind of talked before about 2024 being more of a down year compared to last year. I'm yep. excited about this year because the games I'm specifically interested in are coming out this year with Homeworld 3 and Stalker 2 and a bunch of other releases that are coming out, Rise of Ronin and stuff like that. But I right. do think that downish kind of thing is going to continue as some of these games are going to be one and doneers. Some of these games are going to be Kingdom of Amalur re-reckonings, where they're games they put out and they completely wreck a whole studio, and the studio closes. <laughs> like, like this, some of that's going to be what what happens here, right? Because they aren't going to be able to survive this climate, you know, unless they ship. You got to ship four to six million copies of a game, mm-hmm. and it's like, just I, absurd. It is like before we started recording, I was you know looking at some lists, just, you know, get an idea of what to talk about, and there wasn't even stuff for the later the last quarter of the year and the stuff that is supposed to be released there there was only like 10 or 12 games for the months yeah and it just got smaller and smaller as it got closer and closer to the last quarter like sure there is some good like today as of recording the uh, final fantasy rebirth came out and a lot of people are excited about that Mm -hmm. and that's awesome but, but what else? You know, what's coming out next month? Like, n- nothing huge, huge. Right. You know, and like, yeah, we're just, it's just, it's a very chill, quiet year. And the thought about that, I can't remember for sure if Rebirth is also a console exclusive. It may be. Let's see here. I, I really think quick. it's PS exclusive because I mean that's how the, that's what the, the first half is. Yeah. Right. That's what the first half was. That's what fifteen was, and so uh, or was it fifteen? Sixteen. 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 I think. 16. Yeah, sixteen. Fifteen is the online one. Uh, I think. No, that's fourteen. Fifteen, that's 14. Was, fif- okay. 15 was the rock band. Sixteen Got is it. is Clive. Uh, so. Yeah, and, and even going back to that, like we talked about that, like you were saying, like, yeah, that's the uh, rebirth is the biggest one. 
When I recall last year, I think Final Fantasy 16 moved like over 4 million copies. Square wasn't like ecstatic with his performance. And that's one of the things we were kind of talking about where it's like they weren't doing like it's, uh, you know, it's like really 4 million copies is like you're like, huh? Like, how do you like what's the survival on that? If Rebirth does, it might do more because it's seven, but it might not. I don't know. Um, are they going to be, are they gonna be do better since it is it? seven, like you said? But right, still crazy. But I, it's, but I mean, what like Square? Like it's got to move six mil for Square to be happy with it. That's what I was gonna say. It's probably gonna need like a, a double digit million just for it to be successful. Right, like that's insane, and it's not sustainable. If we're if we're in an age where we where we're where no one can stay employed. Games are becoming less viable, even for small people. And the fact that for you to feel like you were making money, you've got to ship six million copies of a game. Like, that's just not sustainable. It's going to have to, we're going to have to shrink and regress somewhere. And and the biggest frustration of it, I can speak for myself as as a gamer, is that we didn't ask for any of this. I didn't ask for you to spend $100 million (laughs) for your game. I didn't ask for you to take six to seven years to make your game. All I ask is that you make a quality game and you charge a good price for it and you try to be innovative, but more than more than anything, just try to make a good game. Right. Um, That's the things I asked for. And when they were making great games for 10 million and there's there's companies now making great games for nowhere near that much. I feel like you can make a great game and not have to spend hundreds or tens of millions of dollars in several years. Like, but that's the. You didn't have to spend all that money and all that time on Starfield. You didn't. Um, and the fact that that's what you came out with at the end of all of that, it's a little disappointing. And I think it says a lot with the state that game development is in right now. Um, but with all that being said, right, that's all unsustainable. But that's right. even like, like, but that's they can't do that. They can't do that with every game. They can't have seven to 10 years of development and hundreds of millions of dollars on games. That's not sustainable for even a company as big as them. It's not doable. So like, so like, how do we, you know, what are we, to, what are we to do here? I think it's, it's, right. it's headed towards that dark age and there's going to have to be a massive correction. I think you're going to see even more smaller studios. I think we're going to see even more double a games kind of happen. Um, indies and all that stuff are going to become more of a reliable thing. And yeah, the, yeah. the triple A's will become more and more like your, I want to say more and more like your Marvel movies, but like, again, those are even look at the numbers for Marvel movies. Like those are even going down and down. Like yeah, big movies dude, aren't even so hitting much. like they used to. Everything is trending a little bit down because there's not a lot of innovation, a lot of money and a lot of bloat is being spent in different ways. Mm-hmm. And the bloat again, to reemphasize the bloat, isn't the people. It's not the developers. It's not the workers, right? We know what it is. It's the execs. It's the unnecessarily large marketing. It's the unnecessary um, um, focus on a bunch of other things that they think that matter that doesn't really matter. And that's where a lot of the money and a lot of the time gets lost. I mean, like, we yeah. know what that is. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying it, it's, that's, you know, you have, you have movies with $100 million budgets and you look, at the, you look at the the budget and 60 million of it goes to creative. Or they call it above the line, above the line and below the line. You're like, why is 60 million of it above the line? Because 60 million went to pay seven people. 60 million dollars went. This is a hundred million dollar movie. 60 million of it went to pay seven people. You're yeah. like, this is absurd. So, um, in the same way, but it took it took a while for Hollywood to get there. Gaming got there faster. So it's a little bit of a concern, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like uh, you brought up like the indie games and stuff like. I understand indie games, you know, it's usually one or a group of people and it, you know, it takes them years, but that's because it's just, like I said, one or a group of people. So they have to have their regular job and try to do this on, you know, after work on the weekend, stuff like that. And they still release these awesome games. And I don't know a budget for an indie game, but I can only imagine it's probably, you know, I know startup businesses usually cost 10 to 50,000. So I'll assume an indie game is going to cost somewhere in there, Mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of them just kick off and have amazing uh, reviews. And, you know, like uh, Valheim, you said, for example, that one did very well. Um, I know Omno had a lot of amazing reviews. I don't know if that one blew up as much as Valheim, 
but no. I mean, it it still did kind of well for an mm-hmm. indie game. Yeah. You know, uh, I know uh, Lethal and Company. Pretty sure that was an indie game, and that yeah. one was doing really well. Yeah, it was pretty big for a minute there. You know, like I, these big guys can take a hint or two from these little guys. Like we like the same stuff as they're doing, but they're just doing too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's like so. Like those are great examples. So like I'm thinking of even like the smaller the smaller boom games. So we talk about like Lethal Company, right? Um, what was the other one? Among Us was super big, right? No one talks yeah. about Among Us anymore. Yeah, right? I mean that one yeah. took a couple years to blow up, but holy yeah. crap! But it blew up, right? It it's exploded. This, it's this team of I don't know, maybe four or five people. They had this little game. It's whatever, and then all of a sudden, oh, there's 70 million people playing my game, and I have to figure out a way to support this game now that has a player base of however many, however millions or hundreds of thousands of people that are expecting content updates. And, and 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 content drops and DLCs and different things like that, which means I need to increase the amount of people that I'm paying. I need to increase the amount of time that I invest in this and money I invest in this, right? And then, cool, we're going to all play your game for three weeks. And then after three weeks, we're going to all go away. So you'll have more people playing your game than you did three weeks ago, but you'll have way less people playing it three weeks from now. And how are you able to scale and make your company work that way? Is it sustainable? Because those people that remain are going to still want the content updates and the content drops and the DLCs that you were delivering at the height, at the peak of your popularity. But now right. you're not going to have that many, that much money coming in. How are you regulating that? How are you how are you doing that again? You know what I'm saying? It's the, the this kind of boom and then bust type of thing with these games is a hard thing to navigate. And that's why a lot of these studios do end up four or five, six years down the line. They end up fizzling out and you're like why i thought their game was big it's like yeah but it was big and they had to adjust for it and then it died and they had to adjust for it again and it, that's just too many times to pivot for a team or for people that are just into making games for the love of making games and not really trying to become business people you know it's good points so you know and then also again like i was saying so if you want if you want to boil down this this topic to to something short um, I would say to to summarize everything, don't buy a con- don't buy a console ever again. Just buy a PC. Don't buy a console ever again because uh, it's not worth it. And if you got to buy a console, um, maybe just buy a Nintendo one because they're the only ones that are still putting. If you want a Mario, I guess. Um, and then also, um, yeah, just enjoy games while you can. Try to find ways to stream or rent. Don't buy these games. Half of these games you won't even own. They'll take them. They'll take them. They'll take them off. This is a small thing. Well, you know what? I'll save it for final thought because I think it links with this and it's interesting. Mm. Uh, something that happened a while ago, but uh, I'll save it for later. Okay. Yeah. But uh, that that's that's it for my topic. I think we're headed towards a dark age. All the signs point to it. I can feel it on that one. Yeah. Well, uh, let's let's bring it up a little bit. Yeah, let's bring it up. Uh, my topic is, what is something that you learned or did in a video game that kind of leveled you up in that game and you didn't realize before that it was just something simple like that it really like changes it like here's mine for example uh as i said i was playing uh tft quite a bit too Mm -hmm. and um something that i learned is like there's uh a streak like i knew about the streak but I didn't know how much it really affected your gameplay. So, like, okay. if you if you win or lose, it doesn't matter. If you win or lose one or two, there's no reward for that. But if you win or lose three in a row, you get an extra uh, gold. And if you get and that three or four, sorry. And that if you lo- if you win or lose five in a row, that's two gold. And then six plus win or lose is three gold so if you stay on a streak you're getting all this extra gold per round when it's uh pvp because there are pve uh rounds so you can get like items and gold and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and playing a, a lot before this last like week or so i was just trying to do my best you know i was trying to make my best characters best team whatever and i would like win two win three and then i would lose 
I would win. I would lose two. I would win. So I was really losing out on all this extra gold to where I was watching uh, this guy play on a YouTube video and he was pointing out the importance of the streak. So it was like, if you lose, just kind of go with the losing. And I was like, okay, so I lose, I'll just kind of keep it. And I would lose, you know, eight or nine in a row. And I would have all this gold. I could level up so much more efficiently than I was. Like I would get to like level eight at the end of the game if I was lucky most of the time. Like now I'm getting to level nine almost consistently and then sometimes 10 if I really want to push it. Yeah. And in TFT, your level indicates how many characters you can have out on the field unless you have an okay. item that says otherwise. Mm-hmm. So the higher level you are, you know, you know, usually the better your team will be. So, you know, if you have a really good team, your team of seven is going to beat a team of 10. It doesn't, if they're done poorly and yours is done efficiently, mm-hmm. but something simple as that is just keeping a streak in the game really turns the tide in your favor. And yeah. I just did not understand the importance of that until watching this guy's uh, videos. Right. That's so cool. I was, I was, yeah, I was, I was wondering if there was something in any of your games that you just had something, you know, realized or clicked and you're like, wait a minute. And your, your gaming for that game just kind of like got a lot better. Yeah, this is going to be one that seems kind of obvious, but I think as I explain it, it'll become, it'll become like more like, oh, okay, I understand. So I'm going to go back to, I can't remember if it was last level or the level before. I was talking about how I used to play Battlefield Bad Company online a lot, and I would be the sniper. Mm-hmm. So what made me better at that was understanding bullet drop off. Like, oh, but it's but hard sometimes, not, man. Not, but not only understanding it, like understanding it in regards to how it's different for every single rifle. Because what you want to do is, is you want to be able to level up so you can get the next best rifle. So mm-hmm. you can get the next and, and the best one and the best one and the best one. And what I learned is, is that all those rifles have different types of, of drop off. And, and, and how and where they go are different. And so what would happen is, is that I learned like, oh, I have a really good understanding of what this lower level sniper rifles drop bullet drop off is. So even though I can get a better one, I'm going to stick with this one because I can more consistently hit a target. Right. So, right. so that was the thing. And when I started to actually, again, you know, I, I forgot the movie, uh, the movie it's from, but you know, there's like that whole thing where like someone's like, they get a rifle or something and they're like, this is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. Right. Um, right. that was kind of the same thing where it's like, oh, like this game, I have, if I take a second to actually learn this weapon. And again, these are just basic weapons. There's no like buffs or other things you can add to it. It's just the weapon. If I take a chance to actually learn and understand this weapon, how the bullet fall off happens, how I can time it with reloads and all these different things, then I can outduel someone with a better sniper rifle. And that consistently happened where I would be, you could tell by the sound or whatever, like, oh, someone's using, you know, the top tier sniper rifle. And I put, hey, they might give me one one shot. I might take two, but I know exactly where to hit them. I know how I I know how I can measure in the distance and what the drop off would be, and how mm-hmm. I can headshot them or different things like that. Right. And I would win those duels just by knowing and understanding the drop off of a particular or specific gun, right? So like, it's 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 important. I know like like you know a lot of people say, oh, you know like PUBG is like that or different things like that's obvious. That's like an obvious understanding, but. Yeah, the fact we're in like Bad Company 2 is, I don't know, that was maybe 2010 or 2011. Like it was like way earlier, you know what I'm saying? And right. like in, in previous, in like previous playing, playing like COD multiplayer, that was less of an issue because usually there's smaller maps. So you're yeah. not having and to I don't think, think that much about in that game at all. Yeah, but e- even, if, even if there is, the maps are so much smaller, you don't, that's, it doesn't really factor into anything. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're having to shoot someone, you know, however many meters off or kilometers off drop off factors in. So, you know, being able to actually take a second and say, Oh, this is how the gun works. This is how the drop off happens. 
I have a firm understanding of what I need to do with the Amy reticle and all that stuff. That was like, oh yeah. So I was able to take my 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 gaming up to the next level where instead of me getting like, oh, okay, I'm getting seven, eight kills a game, but I've only got like three or four deaths. And I was like, oh buddy, I'm getting 16, 17, 18 kills a game and four deaths because um, I'm understanding now how to how the bullet drop off happens. Just something that's being able to factor that, having that math in my mind as I go to take a shot and not mm -hmm. just thinking, let me aim down, let me, okay, you know, boom, like knowing exactly what the arc is going to be. It helps win your matches. Small little things like that. For real. Helps win your matches and it gets your KD up and you look like a star and all that other stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> that was like something that was really small that I didn't really think about. Also, I'm not a crazy FPS person, so that's not something that's really front of mind, but Mm -hmm. Understanding that little thing was a world of difference in how I played that game and how much I enjoyed it because I was enjoying it okay, being an eight kill, four death cat. But when you step in a match and every time you're 14 plus kills and maybe four deaths or six deaths, you're like, oh, you're like, let me be the sniper. I got this. Right. You guys be the medic. You be the re you be the, the, the assault. You be the engineer. Go fix a helicopter. I got this, you know. Uh, and it was a great feeling. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause also with all that, if you're using one of the guns you're not comfortable with, like you're saying, and you take your shot and you miss, there goes your location. People know where you are, and it just makes things worse. If you're getting those shots faster, you're eliminating those enemies faster, and you don't yeah. really have to worry about that. Yes, right. So and, yeah, and uh, especially like with those games where you have, you know, a lot of team stuff where, mm -hmm. oh, I'm getting shot there in the bush, they're in the bushes. 400 feet off that way, hit, hit them there. If you freaking just one time someone, they can't tell anyone where the hell you're at. And then you're like, all right, cool. They're down. Let me grab his partner, you know, and it's just smooth cruising. And that's how you get it. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good one. I like that one. I, I'm still trying to figure and stuff out, even in Apex, even after, you know, 3000 hours. Right. Well, then too, like you were saying, they, they kind of, they, they change up little stuff every here and, you know, here and there all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's like having to kind of readjust to knowing things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I mean, I don't know if, if there's like a little thing I can go back to, which it, it's a little thing, but it, it's, it's, it's a little thing that works because the game is fundamentally broken. If I want to go back to Madden, right. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to go with, I forgot what is the exact play is called, but it's like four slants. So when you have, you know, two wide receivers on the left, two wide receivers on the right, and they do like a three step and then a slant in right, it works every time because um, they refuse to fix the defenders like AI logic. They just they just don't fix it. Um, and so that play always works. If you need to get a first down, <laughs> it always works. It always works. It never it never doesn't work. Um, so, you know, certain things like that, if you understand, um, another, another really cool small, okay. So another small thing from a different football game, uh, would be the NCAA football 14, um, understanding that, you know, they had the, I think you hold the right trigger, um, to sprint, right. So go top speed. And so the right stick allows you to cut, you know, you can cut left and right juke left and right. But there's a okay. small thing where, like, th those games are physics-based, so momentum actually matters. So a cool thing you can do is, is if you're running and you're sprinting and you just want to move your player regularly with the left button and do a cut without having to use the right stick, you let off of the sprint at the right time, and your momentum will allow your player to cut without having to do as drastic of a cut. You could be a little bit more nimble and get more yards. That's really important to know if you want to feel like you have more control over your player and you don't want to be put into a fixed animation, right? right. If you understand that, you'll be more successful at running plays. You'll be more success successful if your player catches a ball and you're having to, you know, run downfield. You've got defenders catching up with you. Understanding the small little let off and let on and let off and let on of the sprint, different things like that um, will put you in for success. It's it's you can be a hundred percent successful without doing that and just holding strength, holding sprint like an idiot and just running as fast as you can for the whole time. <laughs> but if you go into the little minutia of things like that, 
that's where you get into like that top 5% of those type of players that understand right. that you see them do these amazing plays in the game. And you're like, Oh, wow. How do you do that? How do you do that? Like cut on a dime like that? And you know, it didn't look like the juke move I get. And it's like, that's because he didn't use the standard juke. He used the momentum and physics of the game and knew how to time it just right. The little bit of sprint to kind of switch up juke behind the guy and move forward. Right. That um, that's something that takes time. Like you gotta like practice it to get pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. But it is a small thing that, and again, it's just one of those things like where you do it, you're like, oh, I feel like a genius. I was able to pull this move off, you know? Yeah, that's actually a huge thing in Apex. There's a lot of very timed moves that you can mm -hmm. do in that game. Like when you uh, climb on something, if you hit jump and crouch at the right times, you just go soaring in whatever direction you're holding. So you can yeah. climb up and then just zip left, right, front, or, you know, go backwards even. It's crazy. And there's a bunch of uh, tricks you can do with the zip lines and stuff. It's insane. So that's why the really good players at the game are really good, because their movement is absolutely insane. Yeah. But I did remember another one, and sorry if it's spoilers for anybody, but in Hellblade, you do eventually get, like, a, a, a cooler sword or whatever, Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know through my first playthrough, it was the, the last time I just played it, you can charge your attack. Oh, oh yeah? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, yeah, you can, charge your, you can charge your sword to do like a, a heavy attack. Oh, yeah? Because, you know, there, there's the light attacks and the hard mm -hmm. attacks or heavy attacks. And you can just charge it. You have an extra heavy attack. Oh, okay. I had no idea. I just accidentally held the button too long. I was like, wait a minute. Right. What was that? <laughs> and it just helped because, there, as you know, there's some fighters in that one where hitting them doesn't really do anything because they have like a, a shield or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of like pushes through them. So okay. that, that helps with the fighting. I was like, wow, I can't believe I played the whole game and didn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah, that's um. It's me. So you you discover like like little like your little secrets and stuff like that and just like like other elements or things that maybe the game didn't like really tell you that you just kind of discover on your own organically playing it mm -hmm. those are like the the really cool moments which is why it's cool when you know it's cool to have a game like not 100 percent handhold you through everything and allows you to discover some things on your own about like how you can you know attack a boss or like navigate um to a certain place like i'm i'm, I'm sure i like all these little moments or instances like I have, I think most of those type of moments is like what's built such love that I have for like the Elder Scrolls series is like, it's, it's a ton of those like little things I didn't know I could do. I mean, you know how janky those games are. Like you're, you can definitely all the time you're doing stuff in that game. You're not supposed to do mm -hmm. because they, because it's just so janky, but it's like you find a way to, Oh, I found this exploit. And you're like, Oh, this is super cool. Oh, I can kill this person this way. Oh, that's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think uh, I would, like I like I was saying before, like the first time in El in, in Elder Scrolls Morrowind when, when I like just just killed someone in their house, and I was just amazed. I was honestly amazed. I'm like, wait, I just killed this. Person. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that, and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like in their house. I can use their bed. I can sit in their chair. I'm just here. You know what I'm saying? I automatically thought it was like game. It'd be like game over, right? Like you're not supposed to do that. Just kill the people we want you to kill. But that didn't happen at all. And it's like, oh. Wow. I mean, that's nothing little. That's like an obvious thing you can do is kill people. But to me, it was like a discovery of a lot of stuff, you know? So, right. Um, but yeah, like discovering that and especially like the really little kind of expertise things. Those things are what are the things that makes experts experts in games, knowing those little things like that. Yeah. Um, because most people either don't know them or don't really feel bothered to learn them. It's like, whatever, I just want to play this and, you know, do however. But I mean, I think about all the little things like people like experts in Rocket League know, they probably know Dude. a bunch of crazy stuff. And it's like, yeah, I'm not trying, to, I'm not trying to do some stuff. That. And it's just absolutely insane how well they can control that car. Yeah. I don't even know where it's going half the time. Yeah. And that's I even no like, idea. and I'll, I'll sit there, if I have a good game in it, I'll sit there and be like, ha. But honestly, I didn't know where I was going 60% of that game. <laughs> I didn't know where I was looking. I didn't know where the ball was. I didn't know how to get to where I wanted to go. But if I luck into a goal or two, ha, huh, get like me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you're an expert. <laughs> from, you're I know like, that from your uh, your birthday party. 
oh yeah 100 i'm like oh i've got i've nailed this and i did not know how to move half the time but i mean hey you know yeah the little things you discover the it's little the little things. things really yeah 100 percent um yeah i think that's like the the two i can really think of at the moment um there's like other there's like other things i was thinking about it's like like scarface again not a good it's not a great game but they got this is the thing with bad games is that sometimes they introduce cool ideas that other games that are better than them end up using and they don't get the credit for being the originators right this is mm-hmm. this is my petition for scarface this is my, this was my petition for two worlds two for two worlds was a terrible rpg but they had some really good ideas that other games ended up using scarface has a when you aim at a when you aim at a enemy the reticle shows up and uh, there's a like a aiming like I don't know like a like a, a scope thing a reticle that goes over them and then like a smaller dot inside that reticle that you can move around. So you can move or you can move it around their whole body. So you can move it up to the head for a headshot, right? You can move it to okay. the leg for a leg shot, arm, yada yada. You know, so much like that. But it also allows you to move like it like the outer reticle centers on the body. So there's a little bit of space on the outside of the bodies, a little bit of space. And you right. can move the circle reticle there. So you can also kind of like shoot past or shoot to the side of someone. And so what happens is if you got an Uzi and you're spraying one dude and homie runs up right next to him, you can move the reticle off the center body and actually hit his homie as well without really aiming at him. Which I think is a, wow. a really cool thing to do to be able to give you a little bit more finesse and flexibility in aiming at and shooting people. Right, because it's like I have a little bit of okay, I can reset and re aim, but I can also kind of hit homie a little bit with this. So that, that's another cool thing. I haven't seen a lot of games use that. I think maybe Rockstar uses it in some of their stuff now, which would make sense. I think maybe in Red Dead Redemption 2, something like that kind of happens, but I can't remember for sure. But I'm like, oh, that's neat, that's cool. It just a little, uh, that's it's insane, but what. Simple things can just change in a game. Yeah. Hundred yeah. percent. Um. Well. I th- yeah. I, was saying, I think that's all we got for that one. That's all we got for that. We're moving towards the end of the podcast, which means it's time for final thoughts, where we can make a final thought about anything that's related or unrelated to this podcast episode. So, um, I can give that final thought that I had earlier, and then Let's hear it. so the final thought that I had really quickly is that one of the games I've talked about that I love is Spec Ops The Line, right? Mm -hmm. Spec Ops The Line was removed from online game stores because of a licensing issue. So if you did not buy Spec Ops The Line online, you cannot buy it. Um, The only way you can buy it now is if you go out and buy a used physical version of it. But mm. it's not on Steam. You can't buy it on Steam. You can't buy it on the Epic Store. You can't buy it on GOG. If you've already bought it, you keep it. You have the license. So I bought it on GOG. So I still have it on GOG. But you can't buy it anymore. Um, What's the licensing problem? I forgot what it was. But it was, there was some licensing issue where either time, it's it's like too much time is a lip, like passed, so the license has expired, or there's some other issue. But... When we talk about game preservation and different things like that, this is an incredible, this is another example of that. This is a great psychological third-person shooter. It's a great game, okay? Um, I think that people should experience it. It's a short game. It's six to eight hours. But it's a great, great shooter with a great story. And you can't buy it online anymore. You've got to go into disc replay or GameStop or whatever you store and hope that they have it for Xbox or whoever else that, you know, that, that system it was, it was put out for. And who, who knows however many copies have shipped of that game. I have an online version. I'm probably going to go out and buy a 360, try to find a 360 copy of it, just mm-hmm. so I can have a copy. Because who knows, it, it might get to a point where they say, hey, even if you bought it online, because of the license agreement, you can't have it anymore, so we got to take it away. I think PlayStation had something like that happen not too long ago with like movies or something. They so, They did. I'm not yeah. sure if it was an issue. They were just like, hey, this is getting removed. You're not going to have it anymore. You're not going to have it. Yeah. So um, that's scary. It's another another, another, another sign of the dark it times is. of gaming. Yeah. It, exactly. That is, that is my final thought. 
All right. My final thought is I want to shout out content content creators that sit there and put in the effort to making videos that help other people play. Yeah. Like I I watch, you know, compilations of, you know, awesome clips and Apex stuff like that and I'll watch like a game or two of somebody having this awesome game in TFT. But like as I was saying earlier, this this guy made a three hour video of because he you know recording the matches. The matches are about you know half hour, forty five minutes if you get into the top four, mm-hmm. and explained everything he was doing, why he was doing it, this, that, and the other. And the, I mean that's how I learned about the the streak, uh, you know, and stuff. And now I'm a better player, and that just kind of gets the community to like rise up make the game better everyone understands it more so now it's more competitive and yeah you have a better grip on it so shout out to people who make the game easier and better 100 percent, 100 percent. i would uh if i had to shout out people that did that for a specific game it would be crusader kings 3 people that make beginner guides for it you're basically freaking political science professors making bigger beginner guys for games like that so um like yeah you have to do this in order to get your duchy then you have to do this in order to make your vassal and it's like oh god okay you gotta switch <laughs> oh, this god. type of government and it's like oh, oh it's too much way too much but god bless you you're doing the lord's work for real um that leads us to the end of level 99 of thoughts of players podcast if you like what you heard Subscribe to the podcast on your preferred podcast service, like an Apple or an Overcast or a Google or a Spotify. Um, we are also on the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and, of course, uh, YouTube at Thoughts Players, where we upload video versions of the yeah, podcast. Of if you want to support the podcast, there are two ways you can do it. One is through the merch store. Again, hold up the phone. You can get phone cases, shirts, hats, different things like that. To support the show also you can sign up for our patreon um we have three tiers a two five and seven dollar tier each offering exclusive goodies for uh for the tiers and for patreons again we've got content coming up there uh let's play will be up there pretty soon starting the let's play series for um uh the game dev tycoon um if you are an fps person especially if you're digging apex um, David has started a kind of breakdown series of Apex seasons. He has one up for season 20, which goes over to like all the changes and different like needs and knows in order to make sure you don't look like a complete buffoon with all the changes they've done in that game. <laughs> so be sure to check that out. That's on our YouTube. Find it there. Um, that is it for me. David, is there anything else you want to add? Please. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in and we will catch you on the next level.